Well, thank you so much, Alvin. Thank you, Gunter. Thank you, Melissa, Francois, and colleagues on the panel. Um, thank you so much for this timely and important conference. Uh, Judea, uh, please accept uh, my deep condolences for your loss and may your wife's memory be for a blessing. In our presentation today, Rafa Shams and I will focus on the US campus climate, specifically a climate of anti-normalization vis-a-vis Israel, Zionism, and even mainstream understandings of Judaism. What we'll highlight is the stark contrast and disconnect between anti-normalization trends in the academy and the nascent but real and meaningful dialogue and exchange that is now underway in the actual real Middle East, developing within the framework of the Abraham Accords. Now, as many of you well know, today's anti-normalization has historical antecedents in the Arab world. Uh, and as you know, the global boycott campaign arrayed against Israel is merely the latest iteration of a century old effort to attack and undermine the legitimacy of a Jewish presence in the Holy Land. We can go back to the 1920s and 1930s and the Arab Jewish boycotts. We can look at the Arab League who declared comprehensive boycott in 1945. In December of that year, well before Israel's founding, the League addressed, quote, the Zionist danger by enacting a general boycott of Jewish business in then Palestine. The Arab summit in Khartoum in September 67 resolved no peace, no negotiation, no recognition with Israel. Of course, the infamous November 1975, Zionism is a form of racism, UN General Assembly Resolution 3379 continued in the same vein. So there is this direct line between anti-normalization of Zionism and the contemporary BDS movement. And now as many of you are no doubt also aware, BDS was not a call that originated among civil society groups in the West Bank in 2005. That is a misnomer. The reality is that the BDS platform was prepped in Iran, where Zionism was identified in documents as a movement based on racial superiority. The draft declaration from this prep session in Tehran was rolled out in full just before 9-11 at the UN World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance, the WCAR. By concealing the movement's true origins, BDS seeks to blur any connection to the outrageously anti-Semitic NGO and main UN meetings in Durban, where Jews ended up hiding their name tags and wore caps to hide their yarmulkes, and from which the US delegation walked out in disgust. Now, most people who gravitate toward BDS on the US campus want to support the underdog. They are committed deeply to social justice. They have goodness in their hearts. I've met many of those students over the years and no doubt so have you. But little do they know that the BDS movement has a rigid policy of anti-normalization, something that Mark Dollinger just mentioned. It demands avoiding any and all attempts at mutual understanding. This anti-normalization stance is strictly enforced against Israeli and Palestinian peace activists and against coexistence groups. And BDS calls for the boycott of all projects, all programs that don't sufficiently emphasize Israel's alleged brutality and wrongdoings. In fact, the only people to people engagement that can be condoned are those that support, quote, resistance. Palestinians have long faced recrimination, punishment, and worse, just for acting in a friendly and neighborly way toward Israeli Jews. And US peace groups like One Voice, Seeds for Peace, the Peace Alliance, are condemned by BDS leaders. And there are lots of incidents where coexistence events that these groups have hosted in East Jerusalem and in the West Bank have been violently disrupted. Of particular relevance for the US campus environment is that BDS explicitly frames the expression of solidarity with Palestinian rights as the opposition to any and all educational projects or programs that might promote cooperation and dialogue. A Palestinian campaign 
for Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, or PACB, makes it abundantly clear, as you can see on the slide. And for over 15 years, the anti-Israel boycott movement has been issuing guidelines for US faculty and students, a set of specific recommendations for how to go about implementing the academic boycott, working to cancel or annul events and projects that normalize Israel in the academy. So that even talking to Zionist groups must be rejected and US faculty are encouraged to follow these types of guidelines. At NYU, over 50 student groups responded to that call. So on US campuses today, I think we need to look at a couple things. So first, we need to recognize that the far right is coming onto campus. And it's coming onto campus from the outside, right? So swastikas etched onto bathroom stalls or on the sides of dormitory walls. Uh, or on my campus in Syracuse, uh, dug into the snow in front of dorm rooms. And flyers appear overnight, plastered on campuses, accusing Jews of driving globalism, of pushing multiculturalism and immigration, of infiltrating the government secretly, destroying white man's America. Now, there has been an uptick in this brand of anti-Semitic hate on US campuses. But the good news is that administrators typically handle this type of anti-Semitism fairly well. There are swift and unequivocal denunciations. They don't do nearly so well with anti-Semitism on the left, which is being normalized on campuses. And as we've already heard a number of times at this conference, anti-Semitism on the left manifests as self-defining anti-racists often from minority communities themselves, expressing a rigidly, a rigidly dogmatic, irrational, conspiratorial anti-Israelism. Like far-right anti-Semitism, it also puts Jews at the center of what's wrong with society, the state, and the world. It's a bigotry that also views Jewish history as one of power and privilege. And there's no question that this brand of anti-Semitism is on the rise on US campuses. It's not on the rise on all campuses. There are 4,000 plus US campuses, but Hillel, AJC, ADL, and other watchdog groups have reported a marked increase. The incidents tend to happen on campuses where there's high Jewish enrollment, where there's a geographical element to this too. Most of the incidents are happening on schools in the East and the West Coast and in the Chicago hub. And we can consider the ADL uh, data here, um, there, the incidents did decrease somewhat last year due to COVID related uh, school closures and the move to remote learning. But what's really revealing about this ADL data is that about the same percentage, 24% of the 128 campus incidents last year involved what we would call anti-Semitic forms of anti-Israel and anti-Zionist expression, just about the same percentage as the white supremacists propaganda. Now, I don't have a lot of time here, and I want to turn it to my, my colleague in a few minutes, uh, but we know that there are a lot of incidents that don't get reported, okay? So they don't appear in the data uh, in the ADL audit or, or others. There is a new group uh, called Jewish on Campus, um, and I'm just going to put, you know, some of these um, uh, testimonies uh, from students that this group Jewish on campus is collecting on, on Instagram. Um, and uh, these are anonymous posts from undergrads. Um, most are never filed as biased reports. They've collected hundreds of these. In some cases, uh, they try to connect the students with Hillel or with supportive faculty or other professional organizations to follow up. And when you look at some of these posts, it's clear this is not just a peer-on-peer -peer harassment problem or an issue of students behaving badly. Uh, these posts also point to the role that faculty are playing in tolerating, sometimes even themselves disseminating um, anti-Semitic uh, tropes and canards. Uh, and when you get the PowerPoint, uh, later uh, of, our, of our presentation, you'll be, at, be able to scroll through uh, some of these. Um, now we find at, at uh, our organization, uh, Academic Engagement Network, 
um, dozens of cases that pop up year after year. And we'll share a number of those in our paper and the responses by university leaders. Um, some strong responses, most not so much. Um, one of the most egregious cases this past year occurred on the campus at Cornell when a faculty member at Brown was invited to deliver a guest lecture for Cornell's Department of Architecture. And during her Zoom talk, she literally erased Jews from images in her PowerPoint. And she said, quote, I can't bear to present these people. So she had to blacken them out, literally using a black Sharpie. Now, of course, the pre-1948 period raises tough and challenging questions. Could Zionists have done things differently? Would binationalism have worked? These are uncomfortable questions for some Zionist students. It may be painful to discuss them. It goes without saying that good educators should not shield their students from unpleasant disagreements, but they also have an obligation to foster an atmosphere of tolerance and respect. This kind of dehumanizing rhetoric and imagery should have no place on a campus and needed to be unequivocally and forcefully condemned, and yet it wasn't. In fact, after the Dean acknowledged that the topic was controversial and assured concerned students, alums, and the Hill LED that the school would bring speakers with different views. I mean, the horror of bringing speakers with different views, right? This bland statement that the Dean released caused such an uproar at Cornell, such a manufactured outrage among the faculty who falsely alleged that the speaker and the Cornell faculty member who had invited her had been denied their academic freedom, a petition circled with hundreds of Cornell faculty signatures. Anti-Semitic anti-Zionism almost never entails negative consequences for the speaker. Malicious conduct is defended by relying on academic freedom as Carrie noted to us this morning. Now boycott and divestment campaigns are still happening regularly on the campuses, but we're seeing something much more insidious where college kids are made to answer for Israel, treated as a surrogate and a proxy and a stand-in for the Jewish state. It's a much more pernicious anti-Israel activism. And the upshot is that many Jewish students are reporting that they're feeling fearful of expressing their identities and afraid for their emotional well-being. We'll include a number of examples in our paper and I'll just share a couple. This is from uh, George Washington University. Uh, and this next slide is from uh, University of Illinois. There is no room for fascists, white supremacists, or Zionists at the University of Illinois. And you heard this morning uh, from Nia Lecht about Rose Rich's ordeal. Um, so I won't uh, take the time to, to uh, go into that, except to say that what happened to Rose Rich was a weeks long social media smear campaign by her peers to quote, get her Zionist ass. And eventually she resigned from student government position for her mental sanity. But this is happening at the faculty level too. It's still anecdotal and we don't have a lot of good data on it. But our organization AEN is hearing from lots of faculty members, particularly in certain disciplines in the humanities uh, and especially from junior faculty who are saying that they are hiding their pro-Israel viewpoints in order to succeed professionally, acting somewhat like crypto-Zionists or the Jewish Muranos of yesteryear. And in a recent article titled The Unspoken Purpose of the Academic Boycott, Shalem College's Martin Kramer makes a point about that, how BDS isolates and stigmatizes Jewish academics in America. It's something we're also hearing a lot about from faculty members in AAN. If a faculty member is up for appointment or tenure, does she really want that conference in Israel on her CV? It's a really sobering read, but if there's one caveat we'd make to Kramer's thesis, it's that anti-Zionist Jewish faculty will continue to do quite well in this environment. Now I've written extensively on Jewish Voice for Peace and its role in excusing and minimizing and even promoting campus anti-Semitism. And I put some of the citations to my essays on the screen, two forthcoming and one that would just appeared in the recent issue of JCA. 
Um, and what I'll note for now, uh, that we'll have a section on a Jewish voice for peace in our paper, um, but the most important role that JVP plays on campus, off campus, is defending non-Jewish allies from the charge of anti-Semitism. It still plays that role, but in recent years, JVP has jumped the shark. It's now providing anti-Semitic material for its allies and not just making excuses for it. For some years, JVP has been casting fellow Jewish Zionists as racists, conspiring with Israel to harm their black and brown neighbors. And you can see that in uh, Cecily Saraski's 2015 quote. So it's been going on for some time. JVP seeks to turn anti-Zionism into an ethical and a Jewish stance. And it stokes hatred between Jews and blacks in service of this anti-Zionist agenda. Now, in last week's panels, you heard a bit about JVP's Deadly Exchange, a campaign that alleges that Israel is teaching and training America's cops on the beat to abuse American Blacks and other minority communities. For four years, this campaign has been promoted by JVP and by other campus groups like Students for Justice in Palestine. Conceiving of Israel as a malevolent part of a wider Jewish conspiracy clearly makes deadly exchange an anti-Semitic agenda. Jewish American organizations like the ADL are being cast as a hidden and moneyed force behind the manipulation of governments and state agencies. It's a claim straight out of the protocols of the elders of Zion. And this obnoxious campaign is being pushed on municipalities across the United States and coming onto campuses. And that was before the murder of George Floyd popularized it even further. At Tufts, it's a full-blown campaign for some time and a deadly exchange resolution recently passed here, there. But there are events literally every week across the United States on campuses. Uh, at UC Berkeley uh, a year ago, at a student government meeting, Jewish students were accosted with this remark. Accusing Jews of being the reason for social injustice is of course classic antisemitism. Last June, a petition that circulated among hundreds of students, scores of faculty who signed it in the University of California system adopted deadly exchange rhetoric. This May, UCLA's Department of Asian American Studies promoted the deadly exchange conspiracy theory in its statement of solidarity with Palestine. It's posted on its website and that statement still appears on an official platform of a public university. The Seattle Teachers Union passed a pro BDS resolution that endorsed the deadly exchange libel. And so that's where things stand today where faculty and students across California, a teacher's union in Seattle, dozens of events on American campuses, student resolutions, all of which essentially serve to scapegoat American Jews, blaming them for the racial problems gripping our country. And just to underscore how dangerous this all is, we know that far right white supremacist groups are sharing this Jewish voice for peace, deadly exchange material to their own followers. Amy Elman made the point in her presentation last week that we should pay attention to these convergences, how the far right and far left appropriate each other's central claims. And this is an article from the Community Security Trust. And Dave Rich uh, spoke about this case involving Max Peek uh, last week. So it's worth reading uh, the CST article. Uh, let me now turn the floor over to Rafa who will juxtapose this coarsened and dangerous campus discourse with a very different discourse that's emerging around the Abraham Accords. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you have to unmute yourself, Raifa. And, and thank you very much, Miriam, for keeping with the time and for this fantastic expose. This was very um, deep. Very okay, well, well researched. 
Hopefully, hopefully everyone can hear me now. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so with Miriam's unsettling presentation in mind, I would like to spend some time talking about the Abraham Accords and how they embrace and expand normalization. Um, we, uh, many of you might be wondering why we are talking about this seemingly unconnected geopolitical development in this presentation, but uh, we are seeing that the Accords can offer a surprising and hopeful counter narrative of how normalization can lead to coexistence, collaboration, and mutual respect, and suggest methods of using the Accords as a frame for shifting this um, very unsettling discourse on campus. So just a little bit of background to the Accords. They were initially signed by the leaders of the US, Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain in September 2020. And this marked the first public normalization of relations between Israel and an Arab nation since 1994. And this was eventually extended to agreements with Morocco and Sudan. I'm sure you all remember this photo from last fall. Um, from the beginning, it's very interesting that there was this emphasis on coexistence, dialogue, and collaboration. It was not just going to be limited to the geopolitical and economic realms. Um, if you look at the text of the Accords, um, they were to encourage efforts to promote interfaith and intercultural dialogue to advance a culture of peace, to address challenges through cooperation and dialogue, to support science, art, medicine, and commerce to inspire humankind. Um, these are very you know, inspiring and idealistic words, um, but they, they show a sort of a, a desire to, um, to bridge differences and to connect across cultures, something that seems to be missing on the current, in the current campus discourse. And this photo is actually, um, was actually taken from before the official signing of the agreements. It's from a short US-Israeli delegation that could only stop at the airport tarmac. <laughs> Hey, Ray, if I can I interrupt you a second. Uh, yeah. Someone is actually asking if you have slides. Do you have slides? Yes, uh, you can't see the slides. That's right. Uh, uh, I'm yeah, so yeah. sorry. Okay, I thought thank I was you, uh, Thank you, Amy, Amy, for <laughs> pointing that. Okay, I thought I was sharing my slides. I'm very sorry. Thank you. Okay. So you saw, I'm sorry, so, so this is the first picture and then this, this is the slide I was on. Apologies for that. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, this photo is, is from um, uh, just before the Accords were signed. Um, the LL plane could only stop at the tarmac in Abu Dhabi due to COVID restrictions. But you can see from this that there is an enthusiasm and, and, and appreciation for what was to come um, on the part of, of, of the Emiratis and a certain welcoming of Israelis um, that wasn't really seen in the region before. Um, again, from the beginning, there was this emphasis on people to people contacts, a real desire to connect on an individual level. Um, this is in contrast to previous agreements signed by Israel with say Egypt and Jordan, which might have had high level governmental and military contacts, but very, very uh, little um, interaction between average citizens or civil society groups. Um, and there, there, there are some implications here. Um, it enables the possibility of Israelis and their Arab counterparts getting to know one another as individuals and members of their respective communities to increase understanding and dismantle stereotypes and to enable normalization in the literal sense of the world. Uh, of, of the word, um, this understanding that these nations and their citizens are a normal, natural, organic part of the region and would benefit from collaboration. So um, the early steps after the accords were signed um, signaled um, a sense of enthusiasm that really honestly hadn't been seen before in the region. Um, there's this effusive language used to describe the UAE's response to relations with Israel. Um, the, uh, the, the, the spokesperson at the UAE foreign ministry spoke about an outpouring of excitement and joy, um, a genuine display of enthusiasm, the start of a new era of friendship. Um, at a conference on tourism be be between Israel and Bahrain, the Bahraini tourism ministry said, meeting another culture is nothing new for us. Adding a new country like Israel is very beneficial for our tourism sector. 
um, while this may seem like very a very anodyne statement about tourism and exchange and opportunities, it's remarkable uh, in how it differs from the language used by Israel's detractors, including as Miriam um, presented on many college campuses. Um, that language singles out Israel negatively and makes it into a pariah nation. Here, Israel is just another country with tourist attractions, job opportunities, exchange opportunities. <laughs> Um, it's also remarkable the first uh, how the first exchanges between civil society actors and influencers took place. Of course, this could only occur um, on a very limited scale due to COVID restrictions, but in um, the uh, late fall winter of 2020, a small NGO called Shiraka, which, which had been set up by Israeli and Emirati entrepreneurs, hosted a dele delegation of young Emiratis. Um, to Israel. And they visited the typical Israeli tourist sites and um, visited uh, religious sites, um, both Jewish and Muslim, showing the spirit of coexistence and religious pluralism. They also very interestingly met with um, Israeli Bedouin Arabs who were able to tell their story and about their lives in Israel. And that had the, um, the effect of empowering Israeli Arabs to normalize, so to speak, their own story not just in opposition to that of the Israeli Jewish Zionist one, but side by side with it. Um, and we should keep in mind that these are young people who are highly active on social media as were their Israeli counterparts. So their message was amplified and we can contrast this to the negative ampli amplification of the delegitimizing rhetoric and the hateful rhetoric against Israel, against its supporters that you find in, in, in many circles um, and in social media. Um, we should keep in mind here that these were highly curated visits supported by both governments um, in, in the UAE and in Israel. Let's, we, we should caveat that. But the fact that they happened at all really marks a departure from previous agreements with Arab states. And again, it marks a contrast with the, with the rhetoric that you see um, on college campuses where any interest in Israel or its people or its society is seen as going against Palestinian interest and seen as promoting normalization. And these are some photos um, of just early gestures of outreach um, done, done for, for public relations, done for, for, for to, to, to show this burgeoning relationship. Um, the first photo shows an Emirati and an Israeli woman in Dubai, um, this public display of the flag of Israel, not just as a diplomatic gesture, but just as a, a, as a normal photo, um, can be contrasted to situations where public displays of Israeliness and often even Jewishness are met with opposition and ostracism and hostility. And I really hope that this works and that you can hear this, but this is an Emirati musician who is playing the Israeli national anthem Hatikva on an oud, which is um, a traditional Arab musical instrument. So I, I hope you could hear that and if you couldn't just search for Hatikva on Oud on YouTube. It's, it's quite sweet. Um, well, this seems like a minor gesture of outreach and cultural appreciation. It has some deeper symbolic um, implications. It's conceiving of Israel as a natural and organic part of the Middle East. This playing of an Eastern European melody, which had become the Israeli national anthem with a traditional Arab instrument and this is a stark contrast to the discourse on many US ca college campuses, which frames Israel as a white European settler colonial state with no natural or indigenous ties to the region or to the land. And um, another way in which the Abraham Accords is furthering normalization and connection is through academic collaboration and exchange. Um, again, COVID got in the way of establishing a lot of these um, agreements on the ground, but the initial um, the initial agreements had been signed. Um, there were memoranda of understanding between Tel Aviv University and uh, the Trends Research and Advisory Center in the UAE, the Weizmann Institute of Science and the Mohammed bin Zayed University in the UAE, um, different types of agreements on 
uh, water research, agricultural research. Um, if you look at the, um, the text of a lot of these agreements, there's a focus on the opportunities for shared learning and research and the benefit this is going to have for young people in both countries and the future of the region. Um, there's a sense that only through academic collaboration between these highly developed, highly technologically developed countries can the region benefit from the shared knowledge. And we can contrast this with this consistent dismissal of the benefits of academic collaboration with Israelis and Israeli institutions in BDS campaigns on US campuses. The goal of isolating Israel and ostracizing its supporters or anyone who just might wanna study in Israel takes precedence over any academic benefit. And here are just some photos of um, the initial student exchange visits. Um, I'm sorry, um, student exchange visits. The top photo is the first Israeli student in Dubai. And the second is the first Emirati student in, in, in Israel at, the, at IDC Herzliya. Um, again, if you read articles about these um, exchanges that have taken place, there's this, there's this real desire to know the countries and know the societies um, on an individual level and appreciate what they have to offer. So this is coming in conjunction with um, a growing respect for Jewish religion, culture, and history on the part of the, of, of the Arab nations that signed the Abraham Accords. Uh, for example, um, this photo show is from a photo ex exhibition sponsored by Ben Gurion University, but displayed in Dubai on the history and culture of Jewish communities from the Middle East and North Africa. In Morocco, um, Morocco and Israel signed a joint agreement that there would be a joint curriculum about Moroccan Jewish history. Moroccan students will learn about the state of Israel and the history and heritage of Jews in Morocco, as well as Israelis. This latter part is significant because it recognizes the rich history of Moroccan Jews while seeing the state of Israel as a natural continuation of that history. Um, you can contrast this to situations on US campuses, as Miriam mentioned, um, where many Jewish students are pressured to renounce their support for Zionism or connection to Israel in order to be part of the community of the good. And so, um, and this is also showcasing Jewish history in the Middle East, which has oftentimes been suppressed and erased, accurately depicting Jews as part of the Middle East history and current reality, in contrast to depictions of Israel, which portray it as foreign, temporary, and colonial. And finally, it is an acknowledgement of the story of Mizrahi Jews in specifically. It has the act, it has the impact of empowering them within the Israeli Zionist narrative, but also to give them a newfound respect within the Arab world, which has, has, has not been done uh, previously. There is a commitment to combating anti-Semitism on the part of the UAE and Bahrain and Morocco um, and the signers of the Abraham Accords um, on an official level. Bahraini and Moroccan officials both signed agreements with the US State Department to intend to work together to share and promote best practices for combating all forms of anti-Semitism, including, and this is very significant, anti-Zionism and the delegitimization of the state of Israel. This framing is very, very crucial because this connection is of course um, often denied by Israel's detractors that there's any such connection between anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism and extreme anti-Israel rhetoric. Um, and very interestingly, um, in May 2021, immediately after the recent hostilities between Israel and Gaza um, occurred immediately after the ceasefire, there was a ex exhibition about the Holocaust in Dubai, the first such exhibition in the, middle, in, the, in the Arab Middle East. And I just wanna share a little bit of a quote from the founder of, this, of the Crossroads of Civilization Museum, which was hosting this exhibit. Um, we are all concerned about the rise in anti-Semitism in Europe, the United Kingdom, and the United States. By teaching and informing our visitors about the Holocaust, we will create more awareness about the danger that this negative rhetoric and resulting actions can lead to. As a leading cultural institution in the UAE, it is very important to us that we focus on educating people about the tragedies of the Holocaust, because education is the antidote to ignorance. Now, this is a remarkable statement. But it's also somewhat absurd and a bit topsy-turvy about uh, where a public cultural official in an Arab nation is expressing concern about anti-Semitism in the West, but it is reflecting a current and unsettling reality. 
And finally, um, these developments have led to the empowerment of local Jewish communities. Um, there are there's this influx of Israeli tourists. And so as a result, there are new kosher butchers and restaurants and updated ritual bath and a generally higher profile for the local Jewish community in the UAE. Previously, while they some of them had high level positions and they were not persecuted, they did keep a low profile. They were not publicly out as Jews. Um, the accords gave them this opportunity to come out, publicly celebrate holidays, publicly open schools. Um, there, this is part of the UAE's cultivated image of religious tolerance and respect for different cultures. It is a diplomatic strategy, but it is hard to ally the fact that only with the recognition of and normalization with Israel can the local Jewish community find respect on its own terms. And this happened in Bahrain as well. Um, there was uh, praise, public praise of the Jewish community's cont contributions by, by Bahraini public officials official Holocaust Remembrance Day ceremonies, um, the ability to discuss Israel publicly. So again, you see this very direct connection between the normalization within, with normalization of Israel and the empowerment of local Jewish communities. And you see that as a positive parallel to what you see on US college campuses where demonization and delegitimization and anti-normalization against Israel is harming the ability of Jewish students to feel comfortable on campus expressing their own identities. Um, so these are some of the implications. We kind of went through them through the, um, uh, through the slides themselves, so I won't repeat them uh, for the sake of time. Um, but we need to just keep in mind this parallel and think about what the Abraham Accords and their developments offer as a positive frame for thinking about how the discourse on Israel and Jewish identity on campus can be transformed. So now I'll turn it over back over to Miriam again for a few more slides. Uh, Francois, if we have five more minutes, we will be mm -hmm. done with our PowerPoint. Thank you. Um, so as Carrie Nelson mentioned this morning, the renewed hostilities and the escalation of violence between Israel and Hamas in May saw hundreds of US-based faculty signing on to incendiary petitions and statements that denounced Israel and condemned it for alleged war crimes. These statements have been highly inflammatory, factually inaccurate. They've absolved Palestinians of all agency while demonizing Israel for its quote, eliminatory violence, racial supremacy, brute force, Jewish supremacy, territorial theft, and quote, attempts to perpetrate a modern day genocide. Most of the petitions never mentioned Hamas or referenced any of its responsibility for the Gaza war, effectively erasing the history and lived experiences of Israelis. And a number of the communications also explicitly rejected teaching or researching the conflict from a multiplicity of perspectives and committed the signatories to advancing the academic boycott on the campuses. Jewish and Zionist students are now thoroughly alienated for about, from about 200 degree programs and academic spaces. And this kind of departmental anti-Zionism as Carrie Nelson puts it, is advocacy run amok. Perhaps one of the worst statements in this regard was a petition fielded by none other than religious studies scholars, signing on to the religious studies scholars for BDS, signed by 500 faculty and graduate students in the field of religious studies. And I put the quote uh, at the bottom of the slide uh, from the statement because it's so obnoxious to quote Hillel in one sentence and then in the next sentence accuse Israel of genocide. We need to consider how these, this exaggerated rhetoric about Israel. Well, I think there's yeah, a problem with you mute yourself. I think you were muted somehow, or was it- I am muted. muted. Or maybe an internet connection problem. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. And Rafa, if you could turn to the next slide. Here you have uh, a quote from 
uh, AN faculty members at the University of California, and a number of our faculty uh, wrote counter petitions at Columbia, at CUNY, Franklin and Marshall, UC Davis, University of Oregon, Portland State, Harvard. Um, and I won't read it, you can read it on your own, but it really does point to the problem of hostile rhetoric uh, leading to anti Semitism. And it really is worth juxtaposing these uh, statements issued by student governments, departments, signed by scores of US faculty with the measured responses by Israel's new Arab peace partners. They were very critical of Israeli policy, but they criticized without engaging in any of the hostile rhetoric or the anti-Semitic overtones, tropes, and canards. In essence, they modeled exactly how to criticize Israel even harshly without crossing the line into anti-Semitism. Uh, and right for the next slide. Um, and so, you know, the Abraham Accords were not derailed during the Gaza war. Uh, as Rafa mentioned, uh, a UAE student arrived at IDC in Herzliya, Museum on Holocaust Studies opened the first visit of the Israeli foreign minister. What all this is showing, and next slide, Rafa, uh, is that it's possible to recognize Israel's right to exist as the homeland of the Jewish people, recognize Zionism, recognize Jewish peoplehood and the attachment to the land while also advocating on behalf of the Palestinians. That's what needs to be modeled on American campuses. And yet we're seeing the exact opposite. And Rafa has our last slide. Great, so I wanna just conclude with a few implications on how the positive developments that are happening in the actual Middle East can be applied to the US college campus. The Abraham Accords are the anti-Israel movement's worst nightmare. Um, they hurt the BDS narrative, they undermine the BDS narrative. This, the, 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 the visual imagery of Emiratis walking around Tel Aviv, uh, walking around uh, Jerusalem and enjoying the company of Zionist Jews while also working to help Palestinians too. It reveals a model of peace and prosperity that is transforming the Middle East. Um, and a model where the BDS narrative is not just irrelevant, but, but backwards. Um, it's a model of coexistence. It's a model of collaboration. Um, that is why you see the um, anti-Israel detractors ignoring the Abraham Accords or referring to them dismissively or cynically. BDS activists and organizations opposed them from the, from the beginning. Full normalization, um, fostering mutual understanding through people-to-people -people contacts, and advancing a culture of peace is antithetical to their narrative. Um, one of the big takeaways of what we're seeing is that the anti-Israel movement on campus is oftentimes more radical toward Israel and Zionism and Jewish identity and more hostile towards actual Jews than our leaders and reformers in the Arab and Muslim world. This should be highlighted on campuses. Um, as Miriam mentioned, most supporters of BDS and most support, mo most people who are attracted to their narrative on campus are not poorly intentioned people. They're not deeply anti-Semitic. They are truly interested in peace and coexistence. Um, and this is one way of under, letting them understand that the BDS movement is not interested in those things. Um, and finally, another the, the positive implications should also be highlighted. Arabs and Israelis, Jews and Muslims can coexist and cooperate in an environment of mutual respect and recognition in the Middle East. Student groups can push back with pro-normalization resolutions in their student governments. The pushback to this from anti-Israel groups that will inevitably happen will demonstrate that they are more committed to attacking Israel than they are to promoting coexistence and understanding. And on the faculty level, faculty and university le leaders can highlight academic exchange and hold uh, campus events that show and promote dialogue and cooperation and regional integration. It's a model which will hopefully allow a different narrative than the one of the coarsening of discourse and the delegitimization of Israel that is making the campus environment a more and more uncomfortable place for many Jewish and Zionist uh, students and faculty. Thank you.